Welcome to the sixth episode of Speaking of Poetry. I am Rennie McQuilkin, publisher of Antrim House Books, whose authors are featured on this series. Today I am delighted to be joined by the poet Polly Brody. Polly received a Bachelor of Arts degree from Mount Holyoke College, and after retire, returning to school uh, in midlife, earned a master's degree in biology from Southern Connecticut State University. A resident of Southbury, with a son living in Simsbury, she has traveled extensively in Europe, East Africa, Australia, South, Af South America. As a biologist experienced in field ornithology, she lectures on animal behavior and has been an active advocate for the environment. And I can tell you from personal experience that Polly is one of the finest bird watchers in the country. She is the author of four poetry collections, Other Nations, The Burning Bush, At the Flower's Lip, and most re recently, Stirring Shadows. She's won many awards from her work and has read widely throughout the Northeast. Polly Brody, we welcome you to our series and look forward to hearing your poems today. Thank you, Rennie, for including me in this series. I'm so delighted to be here. I would like to make a few comments about the first book from which I'm going to read a selection of poetry. Stirring Shadows is the title of the book and the intention for its contents was for the poetry to move from the dark cave of mortal situations that might even be in some cases dreadful out into the light eventually of mortality embraced by love, which is quite a different experience and situation. I'd like to start with the first poem in the book. The book is divided into three sections. The first is called Raptor Hush, and this first poem is of that section. Hawk, arrived on its smooth glide path, shadow that took hold of the air, has fastened itself to silence, closed its talon grip on a branch obscure among branches, waits there, slowly craning its neck, making no sudden movements, keeping its red eye on the feeders. A presence made known by absence. My patio bare of sparrows, bare of the ruffian jays. A woodpecker clutches immobility against the dogwood's trunk. Raptor hush. The feathered world won't twitch or twitter until that shadow slides off, carrying its hunger out across the valley. The next poem, entitled Beyond Kuwait City, was brought into my mind by a picture I saw on television. During the so-called First Gulf War, Saddam Hussein's conscripted army invaded Kuwait. His forces were expelled from that country and fled back to Iraq. They had to cross miles of desert, exposed terrain with no cover, and were bombarded mercilessly from the air. There was a huge toll taken of life and material. Beyond Kuwait City, wreckage juts angular bones no longer hot, but yesterday's white blast carbonized flesh and steel. This book survived, soft-covered, its pages graced with flowing inscriptions of Arabic, a book of poems. On a dune's shoulder it lies, wind lifting its pages, a random riffling. A tank ripped open leans above the book. A day ago it bore three frightened Basra boys within its clanking womb. It gapes in silence absolute above these pages rifling. And another kind of shadowed mortal situation. Prophecy. Upon this shore, fog lifts its opaque hem over granite island knees. 
Under a tremolo of gulls, I stalk a dark form facing sea, squatted on stretched webs, tail frayed, wings hanging, feathers plastered tight to bones, an oiled cormorant. Cormorant unmoved even after its gray lid opens without the head turning and its green eye takes me in. And I see what will be, flop of plumage loosely stitching skin, body losing heft excavated by crabs, and finally a cast of bones, vertebrae unstrung, deep breast keels attached by muscle shreds to wings outflung in the attitude of a living bird drying itself. The skull will bleach, its walls grow translucent. Two vacant sockets will read the sand. And I had a dream. I woke from the dream and remembered it well and actually jumped right up and actually wrote this poem. It's almost verbatim from what I remembered in the dream. Ursus horribilis is the scientific name for grizzly bear. Ursus horribilis. The bear has been trying the cash again, mother's voice high and anxious. We have to get out there now before this late afternoon sun quenches behind the black spruce tree line before dusk makes all approaches dreadful. We must take up the weathered boards and renew our lamp black under them, masking again the scent of edible treasure stored in that root cellar. Out in our dimming yard, we kneel at the hatch, turning screws, four on her side, four on mine. The lid comes free. We hurry with black paste, smearing the tarp over our cache. I can feel the bear gathering itself from the dark pooling between trees, swaying there, head down. We stay backs vulnerable until the last screw is twisted home. That grisly, humped dreadnought detaches from the forest, shadowing toward us. And now I'm moving into the second section of the book, which is entitled Casting Against Darkness, where a gesture can be made in the face of mortal situations. And this is a poem that almost didn't enter the book. I wrote it independent of the manuscript that Rennie was reviewing. And I sent it to him, and he said, it must go in the book. And so here it is. It's a real experience I had. Tree frog, no longer than my thumb's last joint, you wince as my scissors cut that hosta stem you grasp. I see your beige tremble just before the blind blades reach you and am glad. Gently I lift both stem and you away from the obscuring plant. Your shadowy veil is lost to a drench of sunlight, yet you cling in stillness save for your soft sides pulsing. Tiny suede skin being, entire even to your toes, each with its minute spatula adhering you, adhering you to whatever is to come. As a grandmother and mom, I often took my daughter and her two young children to Cape Cod in June in hopes of going on whale watches and in greater hopes that on a whale watch, we will be fortunate enough to see whales. And on one of these excursions, we did come upon a pod of humpback whales bubble feeding, which is a very active, wonderful, dramatic activity. Humpbacks feeding. Sleek hulls glide dark beneath a skim of water to port and starboard and below our bow. Wet mammalian heads breach, we hear a gasping pow, then air drawn hissing down the gaping blowholes. The whales sound one after the other and sea grows still, but petrels fret above, watchful in the air. 
Now a surge in royal wells, slate blue depths turn brilliant teal, silver flashes boil up, bait fish netted in a thrumming whirl of clamorous bubbles and singing froth. Leviathan breath so overwhelms their auditory flanks, they're shocked from sense. I would like to think their frantic reel to surface, a sort of ecstasy, to die in such a vortex, such incandescent turquoise splendor. Sometimes, out of difficult situations, we rise to or experience something very special. I was traveling on a jet plane, and in that pocket in front of oneself, one finds reading material, usually very boring. But in one of those glossy magazines, I found an interesting article about Stradivarius violins. And after going home, I did a little research because I noted that the violins of that kind, those special, superb instruments, began to be produced in Europe after what had been called the Little Ice Age. Europe, in the two to three decades prior to the appearance of these violins, had been gripped in unseasonable, extreme cold. The sweetest voice. Each year's growth ring, cramped and narrow, forced their heartwood's fiber denser, tighter. Those spruce, sun-starved, shocked, endured the hammer of a frost-seared age. Boreal cold gripped Europe, fostering glacial creep down slope from tundra to treeline. Icy aprons whited out the green. Through seven decades of long winters, parsimonious summers, forests put on tensioned growth. In their chilled ateliers, Cremonese masters crafted violins from this stressed wood, instruments of tone superior to any other. They believed it was their own fine handiwork that rang so sweetly in salons and courts, but in truth, it was the wood, its voice and timber of travail, that sang and seized the heart into the last section of the book entitled Decantings. A number of these poems are of my mother. My mother and I were good friends. We often went bird walking together in nearby woods and fields. She lived till she was 89 and never lost her love of the outdoor world, a love I continue to feel myself. When she was a young woman prior to her marriage, she was attending the Boston Museum School of Fine Arts, and she was studying as a sculptress. And she was an artist. Mother beginning. She has kept her clay wet, packed in a, tro a crock. Heavy and dark it waits, 30 pounds cut from the Sins bank, laid aside for marriage along with her scholarship to Fontainebleau. In the cellar of each home, she's lifted the cellophane-wrapped lump onto laundry tables, sprinkled that mass with water, kneaded it like dough, packed it away again. Arthritic fingers ache now digging into river earth's density, molding it onto a form. Mother bends the armature, exaggerates its wired statement, to force excitement through thickening clay. Pulling a hip's jut off plumb, cocking the opposite knee, her 80-year-old hands twist lead wire radically, her new shape sprints, leans into a great leap. She had a country home, a pond to which wood ducks came each year, and an old apple tree that would drop its apples each fall. Envoy. She is withering. Sunken cheeks clearly reveal the orbital rim's concave bows, and her dear eyes, still mother, are encased in wrinkled skin. 
She is puckering like sun-dried fruit. Her flavor intensifies like sun-dried fruit. I duck my head to kiss a cheek once level with mine. Each night I think of her laid out in her single bed, arthritic hip grumbling its unceasing discomfort. Mother will hoist that painful hip up the side door's inconvenient stairs lest she disturb the Phoebe nesting by her kitchen door. My mother, even now, will stop to lift a turtle from the road. Today she telephones to tell me how a small black doe has come each morning to browse windfall apples, how she has softly gone outside, sweet-talking, tossing quartered apples, easier to mouth than slippery round ones, and how today the small black deer with smooth skin cheeks and long-lashed liquid eyes has come step by step upon its dainty pronged hooves to stretch its supple neck and take the apples from her hand. That was a wonderful phone call to get from my mother. So touching. I want to finish in this book with two poems. The one I'm going to read now really stands as a different way of approaching death and mortality than you heard in Kuwait, the city beyond Kuwait City, and other poems that are in the first dark section of this book, which speak of death and mayhem. This also addresses death in a different way. Arlington National Cemetery. His ashes earned rest upon a sturdy catafalque. Three sober youths stand alongside, each facing across this bier another like himself, dress uniformed. Outstretched between them, the flag held taut, not the slightest tremble when 21 volleys crack the air, not the slightest tremble when taps floats from the invisible bugle. A senior officer at the beer's head begins the fold. First triangle pressed lovingly upon his chest. Triangle infolded again and yet again upon itself. His white glove palm strokes smooth each slightest wrinkle. His gesture a tenderness for all who lie here and will lie here. The stretched flag glides slowly from the hands of young Marines into that grave gathering triangle. Born to the widow as if it were a child, the swaddled flag offered up from bended knee. And the last poem here, which came to my mind and was again one of those found poems which got written in one fell swoop, was when I saw this bee. The name in Latin for the honey bee is Apis mellifera. Apis mellifera. This chilled November morning, the sun's light wan and frosted finds her head down, burrowing, legs in slow motion, pumping her tighter against the lemon heart of a chrysanthemum. Does she hope there to escape stasis, awaiting her with boreal patience? Transparent wings glued now to her fuzzed back will lift her no more into air gelid with winter's breath. Yet she has found, at last, a golden resting place. May my last bed be as bright. I would like to read now from my chapbook, At the Flower's Lip. And uh, again, Rennie was my publisher. This is a book of love poems. The first six poems in the smallest of the two sections actually are poems written of a time long ago in my life. But the greater section, I'm happy to say, are poems written since I have turned 70 and then the years since when I have been happy with a beloved in my life. 
and these poems have been engendered by that friendship. Once more, the forsythia is blooming again out of season, not the lush yellow effusions, spring proud assertions it musters in April, yet these long in the tooth past year's outshoots dare sport sprinkles of citron blossom. What surge has pushed this color forth? Some flowers bloom once more at summer's end to lure a second pollination should mishap or insufficiency befall the first. My body also would deny conventions of its season and decked in lemon light stretch toward the avid bee. Omphalos, I walk down slope to your darkness pooled there in the valley's cup slip off my chrysalis of clothing and step into you. Your cool liquid caresses my ankles, my calves behind my knees, slides over my hip and belly. I lean forward and lay myself upon you, glide into you. Your black silk sweeps along my rib cage, along my reaching arms, curves in gentle bow waves against my breast. I swim in cool black silk. Moon rising full draws her train upon your onyx surface. I turn into her wake, stroke through quicksilver, light rippling at my throat. From my palm whirl discs of light. I roll onto my back, spread out stretched on you, eyes closed, fingers lax, head, back, buttocks, legs buoyed on your cool depth, laved in moonlight and your blackness. Well, what will I go to next? Let's see. I might change my order a little bit here. Receiving the wind. Ripe wheat, obeisance of stems, heavy with seed. Wind inscribing itself the shape of itself in fluencies of grain. The field eddies and swirls under an ardency of air. Clouds royal west to east cast down penumbral waves across the tawny light of grass, again make visible the hurrying form of air. So do we know passion's sweet seizure in the impress we take upon ourselves our desire to bow and bend under that touch again, again. Psyche. Psyche is whispering, are you listening, Eros? Companion who waits in the darkened bower, not shunning the candle nor what is known by candle's light, yet must be gone when day breaks. Are you listening, Eros, to Psyche, so taken by you, her waking thoughts are half clothed in dreams, her incisive bright edges softened to the pearled luster of the body's remembrances. You've come to her, offered a, offered a silken royal. Now she's poured even into her melodies, composing the rhythm of waves laving ashore at the tide's edge a sorceration, the fingered sand's delight. Hours after you go, she softly resonates, a lute whose strings recall the frets you pressed, the impress of your touch, and vibrate still. Psyche is whispering, are you listening, Eros? This dear friend does not live nearby. So there's a poignant undertone to our friendship. Headings. Homeward bound, going east, the interstate flowing smooth under my tires. Planet Venus rises, bright pearl in the eastern sky. Yet I am watching in my rear vision mirror, a huge orange moon setting toward a receding horizon. That same splendid moon I know is sinking before your eyes, beloved, on your way west, leading you home. 
setting unhurried moon lingering in the glass. I cannot keep my eyes from backward glances. You and I again parted, traveling our opposite directions. And I can't refrain from that mirror, watching in rear vision glass the vision that rides before you. Banquet. I keep our pillowcases all week long, sleep in the fragrance of our sheets, faded yet sweet, space unfilled beside me. Without asking, you knew a fusion delicious to my senses. The oil, its anointment lingers, antimo, echo of almond, pressed macadamia, kikui, and hemp seed. Bringing ourselves from lives not otherwise commingled, in this sanctuary, we are decanted to each other. And my last poem, Equinox Moon. Awakened into opal light, sheets and quilt shining, beyond the window, wind chivies branches, their shadows waltz across me. I lift hands open-fingered into a sea of radiance. Shadows print my pillow, but all my edges haloed. I stroke the air as if it were a harp. If you were here above me, your head and shoulders would be haloed thus. Move your fingers in the air. Your finger shadows play upon my moonlit body. Watch yourself caress me without touching. I am your harp. Thank you so much for allowing me to share my poetry with you. Thank you to all on the staff here who have been so welcoming. And again, thank you, Rennie, for having me be part of your series. Polly, thank you so much. We, we've, been, uh, we've been honored and blessed by your poems. Uh, I think we feel a little like the uh, deer that received uh, apples from uh, your mother. Uh, and I have to say, your poems were cool and delicious, and we, we savor them and uh, oh. appreciate them. Thanks to Ken Picard and Karen Handville, who've made this program possible. And uh, please do visit our website, uh, www.antrimhousebooks.com, if you would like to learn more about Polly Brody and uh, her poems, read some sample poems, perhaps sample some other Antrim House poets. And please come back uh, next month to listen to the next installment of Speaking of Poetry.